Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Hassan, for inviting me. My name is Manuel Delgado. I'm professor of architecture at Wentworth Institute of Technology. Uh, I appreciate very much the invitation, and I fr frankly regret not, not being able to be here yesterday. I really would have enjoyed the presentations, and the company has been very ple a, a big pleasure to be here. Uh, I would like to start this uh, talk today just with Renata's quote about landscape archaeology, which I liked very much. Uh, I, I don't remember the name of the person you just quoted, but she sa he said, look at the landscape and you will learn something about the society. And I hope that at the end of this talk, uh, uh, you know more about the society, the, the, the landscape and the society in, in Venezuela, and that helps us, and I get the feedback that you, uh, I'm sure that you're gonna give me in this, uh, in this conversation. The, I, I, I should title, I had the title, or the original title of this talk was Memories of Air, Water, and Earth, an Assembly of Park in Caracas, Venezuela. And I, I now I think I would call it differently. I would call it Memories of Nature as a Living Inspiration for the Urban Transformation of a City. And this is based on a competition that a team um, that I work with uh, from Medellin and Boston we made a team of architects from Medellin and we participated in an international competition organized by the mayor of Caracas, Venezuela, to develop a park in the former airport of the city. A, a small airport actually was a, like, a, originally it was a company airport that developed into a military base and is now in the middle of the city, uh, uh, blocking the possibilities of relations and blocking the possibilities of connections and social connections in the city, in a city that is profoundly divided by society today. So I'm gonna start showing a little bit about this landscape and the traces of this landscape, how they evolve in time. Caracas was a city founded in, in, in 1576 or 78. Uh, uh, the, the construction of the city, the first traces of the city are based on the loss of Indies. But in this case, uh, as in many other cases where the laws of Indus established the grid, the traditional grid oriented north-south uh, with the hierarchical spaces, etc., the nature of the place had a very important role to play. So from these early maps, you start looking at some elements that are very interesting. The, the fact that the city grid was established in between um, topo a very strong topography with a presence, a very important presence of, um, of the mountains in the north side and the Caribbean uh, in a distorted uh, approach looking at the, at the north and the presence of these uh, brooks coming down from the mountain developing into a river down here called the Wider River. The beginning of the city um, established the clear differentiation between the grid that established by the Spanish and the nature of the, the, nature of the place. In the evolution of these maps, I'm gonna make uh, the evolution short with a few uh, images you see the interaction and the presence of the, the traces of, the, of nature and the traces of uh, human uh, in, intervention dialoguing together in, in creating a very special condition of a landscape in balance with nature and in balance with urban development. This is started to develop and to grow, and, but still uh, in the 18th century we can see the traces of this uh, city uh, in this case, upside down, the, the, the north, sh in this case, is, is down here, I'm sorry, because of the Caribbean uh, Sea. So, but this, this uh, map is actually looked from La Guaira port coming into the city through the, the weight of the mountain in relation with the scale of the city. So the, the dialogue persists, and here you can see uh, this, uh, and you will see in the future, uh, in the development of the city, how this dialogue is broken completely in the relation between the nature and the city. In, in, in contemporary photography, you can appreciate uh, really uh, the dramatic situation of a c contemporary city of approximately four million inhabitants uh, suffering from the circumstances of being constrained in a, in a very narrow valley and uh, that avoided all the possibilities of the relationship between nature and the urban life. This is the city in the 19, 18, uh, 19, uh, 18, uh, 1880 approximately and uh, the 19th, uh, late 19th century is still a very small town, 
Uh, you can see from the west to the east, in the, in the east direction, you can see the, the big Avila mountain in the background, and the valleys of agriculture where they, that fed the city at that moment and balanced the original uh, economy of the place. And a very, th th this shape lasted for three centuries without m very little change. In the 1950s, or earlier actually, in the 1930s, uh, the development of the oil industry started to bring a lot of development into the city in a very uh, strange way because the, 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 con the, the conditions of the original grid and the original settlements were not taken into account. And at the same time, the topography and the valley really in, uh, uh, offered the opportunity to be in balance with it, and, but the, the development didn't do that. A car-oriented development spread out to the, to the east, and here you can see at the moment uh, that we will be talking about this space that remained, uh, fortunately remained as, a, as an airport, but also was preserved. It's, it's kind of a contradictory situation because in some ways it blocked the relationship between the east and the west, north and south of the city in these directions. But on the other hand, it was kept and preserved as an opportunity for the future to be taken into account for the future development of an open space for the people. You can see the construction of the airport simultaneously with the development of the east of the city. And uh, this is also, uh, besides being a, a, a collective history, this is also personal history about myself living. Uh, I was born in the center of the city, in that area down to the, very close to the original foundation area of the city. And I participated in my youth. I grew up in the south of La Carlota Airport and the new developments that were the, uh, created for the new middle class emerging from the oil boom. And I happened to have my school in the other side of the uh, the park, of the of the airport, in what is in the north, the area, uh, the more uh, more developed area called La Floresta, where there were, used to be um, um, cultural activities, etc. And I had to drive. I had to drive within a bus, riding a bus all around the park, uh, all around the suburbs of Caracas, in order to get into my school, like an hour and, uh, hour and a half later. So having the reminder remain, reminds me that the possibility of going across this park or this in the future would, would have been a very interesting opportunity for me and, and my family. Now, this is the situation of the valley as it is today, uh, where you can see uh, the, uh, the location of the La Carlota Airport right here. And I'm gonna show very quickly a set of uh, evolution of the images of, that show the ev evolution of the traces of the city within the valley. So I'm just going to be very fast. The, the, the brooks and the water coming from the main mountain in the north, the Avila Mountain, going into a river called the River Guaire, collecting all the, uh, all the waters, the drainage of the city. And the development of the city from the original traces of the colonial city here into the east, along, at the beginning along uh, farms and areas of uh, haciendas and co cultivation, but later on in the process, all completely blocked by the construction of the development of the city in a very intense way. In the middle of all this area in the east of the city, you can see the, the trace, the footprint of the airport and the relation with a very interesting also park by Burle Marx called the Parque del Este, which is from the 1950s as well. The elements of transportation that grew later in the city developed a, a very important uh, east-west metro line that helped to solve the problems of congestion and transportation, but it was not enough. And the relations of the city north-south completely blocked in several circumstances by the river and by the airport. So this is, this is the map of, of Caracas in the 1950s when the situation changed. And I wanted to show this one because you still can see the, 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 the balance between the structure of the, uh, imposed by the, by the urbanization and the balance with natural elements of the city that from here on in the 1960s and 70s started to be blocked completely. It's the, here you can still see the hacienda spaces in, this, in, in, the, in the north of the river Guaire in this area was very prosperous area and was the most cl the closest haciendas to the center of the city in production at that time when the, the land was bought and decided to be transformed into an airport. 
in, in that time, in the transition time, you could see the evolution from a river, like the wider river in this location, uh, very friendly, uh, accessible in the, in the valley, to a conditions of a, a wider river canalized that floods uh, every year, that creates conditions of ter terrible uh, congestions and situations like this because of the lack of control of the flooding elements. So this is one of the elements that we attacked. Issues of transportation. The idea, the utopical idea of a highway, like in the American way of life, expanding into the suburbs, transformed later into a very congested, top congested in both sense, every time during the day, and, 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 and not only in peak hours, completely congested and taken as a public space for, for big, big lines of traffic. Urban development. Examples of urban development traces that the transformation of the city in the 1930s by Rotival developing in the center grid of the city and a monumental axis to connect to the east to the west in, this, in, the, uh, in the way of the big uh, 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 boulevards, European boulevards transformed into a highway later on in the process, like you can see here. Some elements of modern architecture for also from the 1950s, uh, prosperous time in, 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 in Venezuela, developed very interesting prototypes of mixed-use buildings, commercial and offices in the downtown area, following some criteria about the, air, the development of the air rights, because actually this development is in, in the top of a highway that started, uh, be, be started being like a boulevard and was transformed into a highway for some uh, mechanical purposes in, in order to so-called improve the traffic. But the, the successful experience of an air ride development here on top of the highway to connect the north and the south that was completely blocked and divided by this construction of the highway are examples of those traces of the city. And here you see the same development with the, the exit of the highway in the 1950s, very, uh, starting to be very congested by that time and the, the mix of uses in the, in the development of the, the building. To the, the city that we have today, uh, this is the same axis that I just mentioned before, going to the west, from the west to the east. Several experiments of solutions of housing failed, uh, and uh, basically the, the, the overwhelming uh, in, uh, people that came to the city in between the 1950s and the 1980s multiplied by four or five the population from one million almost to four million. In, in as it is today, in a congested city where you, inequality separation, dis disgregation, and the lack of open space, of course, were some of the problems that we faced in the city. When I talk about inequality, also the lack of control in terms of the growth of the city with the great densities in the periphery, in the hills, and low, sometimes very low density in the center where the services are located. Some regulations, for example, allow the Avila Mountain to be preserved uh, from the Cota Mill or the, 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 the 1,000 uh, contour is here in relation with the 1,000 is because it is 1,000 meters above sea level in the other side. So th some regulations preserve the Avila Mountain of this extremely uh, um, focus, uh, I would see developers uh, focus the, uh, uh, construction of the southeast and the south of the city, leaving many areas in the center of the city with very low density and uh, leaving the opportunity of spaces like the Carlota space and the airport and the Parque del Este here to be open for future development. And traces that I wanted to show the, in these pictures from uh, Nicolas Rocco, uh, showing the extreme inequality of the city, uh, super, surviving uh, in precarious conditions, many of them, uh, millions of them, and divided by some, some narrow highways or situations that really confront people with each other and had, have had very ex important con uh, results in this political situation that Venezuela is living at the moment, that we could talk about that later if it's needed. Some views from the east towards the west, looking at the relation between the nat natural elements and the uh, informal settlements in the, so the w east parts of the city. So in this, in this context, we participated in this competition and we actually won the competition with a proposal that had, in a, 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 I would say, the main principle of, of the proposal was to take out things, not to bring new things, but to restore basically the memory of the place. 
the memory of the na the nature, the memory, memory of the air, memor memories of the water, and me memories of the land. But in order to do that, several uh, strategies had to be, had to be developed. The first one, I, we, I would say, we developed four basic strategies that we wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about here. The first one, environmental balance, watershed and natural landscape recovery of the valley, strengthening ecological connectivity between the Avila and the main river, widening, and the hills to the south. Contribution to the river sanitation and flood control, renaturalization of the river and streams, and consolidation of a metropolitan park system and green corridors using the potential spaces of the city. Second strategy we call the urban dynamics. Contribution to the urban mobility of a city that has been congested by the increased use of the private automobile, connections of the urban fabric and transformation of the park into transportation hub, integrated to the metro system and other public transportation alternatives. Three, new mixed use development, compact and polycentric models of occupation with emphasis in ecological and economic sustainability to develop density and services in a certain, in a new centrality at metropolitan scale. Using the airspace previously occupied by the approach cone of the airport to develop uh, buildings and, and, and real estate. Develop a special plans for, with local municipalities and residents to increase the density of the surrounding neighborhood and new rental development on public land on top of the highway. And fourth and lastly, the social encounter as a consequence of the whole, the, the three previous strategies, creating the opportunities for education and innovation, new public space, cultural institutions and sport facilities, creation of an air park to honor the memory of the place as an airport, allowing recreational activities open to the sky. The same space would serve as an open space for large gatherings, concerts, fireworks and demonstrations. So this force strategy is complemented by the last one, which would merge the fall of them into a, manage, a management model that would make this possible and feasible, help us allow to develop these strategies to transform the space into what we think should be, for example, in the four elements, the environmental balance, talking about restoring the watershed and talking about restoring the possibilities of flood plains in the area that was in a river that originally was flowing freely and was needed to be canalized because of problem of sewer and, and drainages mixed completely with the, 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 the need of the reconstruction of the sewer system in order to create a very uh, co a comprehensive system of drainage. So the, the integration, the, the, the natural integration of the north of the south of the ecological corridors, the uh, in habitat, in habitation for a species, the reconnection of a space that was completely blocked in three uh, proposals from the original structure, ecological structure of the city to the new plan, plan structure of the city. Some views of the ex situation of the brooks coming from the Avila into the river. This is one of the good ones. M many of them are in terrible in worse conditions. And this is the situation of the river as it is today, totally canalized and trans uh, mixing uh, drainage, sewer, and all, uh, all the waters in the city in a way that is not necessarily accessible for the people. Our proposal, restoring, restoring the flood plains, by doing that we needed to eliminate, among the things we started eliminating in order to rescue the memory was the, the runways. Most of the competitors kept the runways because, and reused the runways, but in, in our case we decided to eliminate them in order to create uh, the flood plains that would allow the, the expansion of the waters and not flood in the city. And these are more, more or less the results. The movement of the river allowed to for the flow of the natural course of the river as it, as it was originally, restoring the topography and recreating the, the flood plains and using the, 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 the soil taken from one side to recreate the open space in the other side of the park. Some views of the proposal, uh, uh, trying to keep, the, uh, showing the different times of the year in wet season and also in, in, in dry season. The, the, the restoration of the environmental balance of the city was also complemented with the idea of connecting the brooks from the Avila Mountain into the park as a park system, 
in both directions, trying to reconnect all the flows of uh, natural life from both sides of the city. In terms of the second uh, aspect that we try to cover, urban dynamics, we called it, uh, the, the idea is to restore the, the, the opportunities to connect the city in different ways, as uh, not as it is today, by creating a, a certain macro blocks within the park of connections north-south that does not exist right now. You can see the existing situation in that graphic up there and the proposed situation basically for transportation in both directions, plus the connectivity with a pedestrian system that could allow the and an, an all sorts of uh, streets from one side to the other that could connect the, the city together, and the creation of a transportation hub for uh, um, different modes of transportation to in exchange from the metro cable, cable in some of the hillsides of the barrios, the poor neighborhoods, into the tram or, or, or metro tram, into the metro system, which is underground. So transitional systems using the park as a hub for transportation as well. And here are some of the examples of the roadways that we propose to cross the, the park from one side to the other. And something very important in terms of the urban dynamics is not only the, the everyday transportations, but the movement in case of emergencies, because the reason to keep the runways of the tracks would have been in order to keep it for an airplane, in order to, uh, in, in case of a tragedy for movement of goods and, and services in case of a, a problem. And uh, we, dis we discovered that the possibilities of contemporary helicopters are much better suited to do this type of job, and we could keep a very important heliport while keeping the park in the other areas. And uh, the, the third topic about urban or mixed-use public and private development, in the, you can see, thanks to the runway, you can see that the surrounding of the airport is very low density. So just by taking out the, uh, just by taking out the runways, Sorry, uh, we could we could very easily de develop those areas in the extreme sides in both sides of the air airport and develop more densities in the points that we needed for the city. Like the proposals of those are replacing replacement housing and a mix of uses in areas that are, are totally underdeveloped now, and we're planning to propose in order to preserve the the quality of the green space. In the center, we, we strongly recommend it to develop the periphery in order to bring life into the park. Those are some images of the workshops that we organized to develop the housing in the surroundings. And these are the areas that would be more developed in the moment of a new uh, proposal of a new organization of high density and mix of uses in the extremes of the runways. And uh, the use of the air rights as a lesson learned here from Boston trying to cover or use some of the space of the highway uh, that exists right now in this north part, separating the, the Park del Este the, from our new proposal, uh, creating a belt of housing and mix of uses that could transform this into a, a more, more than a highway as it is now, more like a boulevard with activities, that uh, pedestrian activities that could connect very easily the north and the south of the city. And these are some of the examples of the creation of the housing and development in the surrounding the periphery of the, of the areas. In like these ones, examples of uh, new buildings that open the views north-south, so keep the flow of, uh, of hair, air and views from the south to the north, and at the same time, step down into the lower density of the urban areas in the north and, the, and, the, and in the south of the, of the park. Those are some of the examples of the use of their rights on top of the highway. And the, the barrios like La Floresta or, La, or Chuao would get incorporated into the, the park system in an easier way. And finally, the fourth point that I wanted to comment on, I think the most important one, the opportunities that this space, that an open space like that, bring to the reconnection of the city, of the people of the city. A city that doesn't have open space and has been uh, divided by the uh, uh, politicians uh, offering conditions that are not working necessarily, have developed a society that's extremely divided in, 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 in classes. And uh, the, this demonstration shows in some ways that possibility. And the park allows, by looking at this direction, you can see the, the point, the central point that this park represents in the future. 
uh, from different points of the city. Uh, this this place could be the open place for the for innovation, for education, uh, opening the land for the for new development and for natural encounter. So you can see it here uh, as it is now, the Parque del Este by Burle Marx in the north, the highway in between, and part of the proposal of the social encounter that we are making with the part of the situation that you see now from the e from the west looking at the east and the fact that the possibilities that this space that in some opportunities can be used for emergencies could all year round be developed as a big agora of the city as a place of encounter for concerts and all sorts of activities and the idea of the center of the of a place for celebrations and a place for encounter i think this is it i don't know if i'm in that's fine thank you very much okay thank you, thank you. Can I, I mean, I, I, I'm interested, I'm sort of playing with an idea, I'd, I'd like to ask you both to comment on it. Um, you know, the idea of memory is, you know, very important to both of the presentations that you gave, but I wonder how memory is expressed in professional terms for architects and urban planners as, you know, the role that it plays in sort of the professional standing, the professional ethic. Uh, in relation to the kinds of projects that you do, because obviously uh, the other structures are built as well, and the other approaches to uh, development are taken as well by professionals. And I'm interested, not knowing much about this, about you know how this is there a battle over memory within sort of the professional standards that you're working with uh, on projects like this when you're confronting very different approaches to what should be in a place. Uh, well, I'll start with the example of uh, the palace in uh, Java, simply because it, it uh, very literally uh, presents two options, the colonial Williamsburg option versus uh, something else. And uh, I think we're going to hear later uh, from Jeremy about uh, the different values that can be uh, embedded in, in different projects. Uh, and when I present this work to Hassan's class, I'm very explicit about uh, Alois Regal's uh, identification of uh, you don't just, there's more than one way to preserve something, and you should look at what is important and then preserve uh, or operate uh, according to what is important. And so, it's in that in those terms. I think it comes down very clearly to um, what is important: is the uh, presentation of a falsified cultural um, show uh, more important than uh, the value offered by an ongoing, unbroken, continuous tradition stretching over hundreds of years and into the present. And um, it's, it, it is very, I, I think it's a very valuable uh, example and I continue to present it because it is so clear uh, of, of exactly how you put it, these two uh, options for how memory can come into play in what we do. I would, I would respond to your question from the the ethical point, the ethical role that we can have in this awakeness of memory that does not necessarily is in the minds of the people that may have been forgotten. And the, the fact, for example, that in Caracas, probably the, the population of Caracas forgot the possibilities of the use, the accessibility to the nature, the, the possibility that they, they can be reconnected, that the city can be, can be a link instead of a fracture. The, the possibility that uh, and the example of Medellin that Robert brought is very interesting as well because architectural intervention demonstrated the possibilities that communities, society can be together in a place and the sense that the role of the place, the quality of the place is very important, the quality of the design aspect is not only the social restoration or the economic development, it's also the expression that that economic development and restoration can have in a space 
frame that is a mirror where the people can be looking at themselves. Yeah. So coming about the um, main example with the mayor putting in the uh, places right, right at the sites of violence, it, it raises an issue of sacrifice in touch New York, of offering, not intentionally, but turning something that had been unintended and, and um, product of, of uh, violence against another group rather than a sacrificial offering to to see something in a way that out of the worst situation we will make something higher than even more than we even could have ever imagined. It seems like an interesting, very compelling human situation. Well, in a, in a way, I, I think that's very well put. In a way, it's uh, the kind of response that we see from designers and others in response to natural and man-made disasters. Yeah. So uh, one of the examples that I was going to show but didn't was uh, the uh, reconstruction efforts in Aceh, Sumatra after the uh, tsunami. And the mantra there one thing, there was a lot that divided us in terms of what the approach should be, but one thing that more or less united uh, the people working on those efforts was uh, the slogan, Build Back Better, is that out of the worst uh, destruction, uh, we can uh, create something that is optimistic, forward-looking, and dramatically uh, better uh, for the people who have already suffered so much. I think similar ambitions uh, are found uh, in the early days after Haiti the, the, uh, and all natural disasters. And so, in a way, this is a more localized version of that instinct uh, that designers have. Uh, and I think, as part of the ethical obligations of our profession, uh, is very much embedded in who we are. We don't have a Hippocratic Oath, but uh, uh, if we did, it would be something along these lines. You so said that you, you painted a multi-pointed star. And this is... Steve, I don't know if I think you might need I'm a sorry, microphone. The, 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 I, I just think, I think that your, your series of examples is a series of extremes. At one end, Williamsburg, uh, at the other end, Medellin. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a but there's a there's a part of the world that's inhabited by Levittown, mm -hmm. which seems to me um, missing in the in the in the dialogue. Uh, Levittown is a kind of acknowledgement of a of a class of people who volunteered to serve and came back to a difficult situation. I'm using Levittown because it's the one that jumps into my head, but uh, how, how do you think, both of you, how do you think the gray zone figures into this conversation? <laughs> after you, no, after you. Go ahead, go ahead, you first. Um, well, between now and when Levittown experiences its disaster, uh, I think in a much more day-to-day -day sense, and I tried to make this transition uh, between Tiananmen Square, Schindler's List, and then straight to uh, the spatial experience of cities throughout the world as they uh, move from streets are for people, something we went through in the 1920s when there was an a marketing agency developed the concept of jaywalking to make streets safe and legally uh, uh, reserved for automobiles. That was an effort, that was an initiative, and that occurred, and now it is playing out uh, all over the world as uh, the public space of the street is privatized by people displacing, and it has become a routine, nat it's become completely natural. And one thing that Bourdieu teaches us is as soon as it goes without saying, it probably deserves a second and third look. And uh, Levittown, uh, it went without saying at the time. I mean, the example of Levittown immediately makes me think about that which goes without saying in its original construction. Um, everyone 
was given an economic incentive to leave the cities and move to the suburbs. And I say everyone on purpose, um, as long as you're not black. Uh, there were restrictions and this was not available unless you were white. And so the everyday, mundane, day-to-day -day reality of Levittown, under that surface of that which is, seems perfectly natural at the time, uh, is something that is fundamentally unnatural, constructed, uh, and profoundly harmful. Um, and so what are, I, I think of the, film, uh, the films of uh, David Lynch, where suburbia is the bucolic setting for profound evil just below the surface, you know, blue velvet, uh, et cetera, that whole genre which uh, some of us love. Um, partly because that which goes without saying is problematized uh, to the great delight of movie-going audiences. I don't mean to trivialize it, but I think it helps to... And then Mad Men uh, is another situation that goes without saying is perfectly normal, but with the hindsight of several decades, all of a sudden, it's like, wait a minute, look at the roles the women play, look at how the men, uh, so the Mad Men phenomena shows us something that we took for granted uh, several decades ago. Is there a way that we can accelerate that way of seeing? Uh, can we start to see those things instead of waiting uh, 40 or 50 years, uh, in the case of Mad Men, can we do it in 40 years or 30 years? Or can we see right now uh, maybe the sudden shift of the uh, gay marriage situation is a way that we made the connections quicker and seemingly more suddenly in historic time than we have in the past. So I don't know if that... I wanted to add to, uh, from the example of Caracas, I can say trying to follow the trace of the city and trying to learn about the society in the case of Caracas. The society abandoned the center of the city because it was congested, because it was not working, and moved to the east in order to create this ideal society, suburban society. Abandoning the center, the center got lost, it's completely ruined, and then the, the east of the city is totally congested now, and the city is completely packed. So res rescuing the memories first, nature, of course. The second, the urban life, the idea that the city can be reconnected, can be linked, and the traces of the city can be the opportunity for the people to be together again. This is, uh, as I, I would say. Julian, you had something? And then, no, I think it was Jeremy. Sorry. Yeah, the, the comment and the question. Um, so it struck me that uh, the example you gave of the work you did in the Javanese palace is uh, sort of maybe framed in a different way through like authenticity. Either uh, you can observe uh, the authenticity of the fabric, or in the case of the French you went in, authenticity of meaning. So there's still authenticity being dealt with there, and I think it's kind of a useful way to reframe how we design treatment for historic environments. Um, the, the question I had is, I thought it very interesting that in both of the uh, studies that you presented, um, they both involve uh, favelas or slums in some sort of way. Is there something about slums or the memories of slums that could actually influence or help how we deal with urban environments? Is there something we can learn from them that we can use? Um, well, I think that uh, it's become quite uh, chic to um, look at slums as a source of not just uh, disgust and, uh, uh, and lamentation, uh, and actually without, uh, without, without paying proper attention to the suffering, the very real suffering that occurs in slums, to see something uh, uh, instructive about emergence. Uh, you know, architecture is pathologically uh, vision-oriented as we've inherited it from the 20th century, but some of the most successful architectural visions are ones that acknowledge the operation of natural systems, the operation of human social uh, dynamics, uh, cultural formations that are uh, less susceptible to top-down imposition and you'd better work with these things rather than work against them. And so uh, by 
the, the most successful top-down visions of the 21st century will be the ones that pay proper attention to natural uh, occurrences in economic forces, especially as national and local governments uh, face the reality that uh, infinite growth is not going to fund debt uh, spending in the present. Uh, so we'd better start to live within our own means. And so there's a huge financial advantage uh, and incentive to start latching into these uh, understandings of how emerging forces, such as those that are in evidence, uh, the innovation of the, uh, and we talk about slum dwellers less as um, peasant losers, and some people are actually pointing to uh, these areas of informal settlements and saying, pay attention to this group. This is the dynamic movers and shakers that will be the next big, uh, I don't like to use the word middle class because it portrays a false uh, sense of geometry, but the consumer classes will come out of the favelas and the barrios and the, uh, whatever word you use from whatever part of the world you're in because these are the movers and shakers who picked up, left, came to the city because of opportunity, and some people point to these areas as a sign of success, not failure. Yeah, this, this question about the slums brings me some <laughs> reflection about, I, I think the societies, at least in Latin America, that I have uh, examples uh, really close, lost a lot of time and wasted a lot of time trying to replace the slums by another type of architecture that never worked. Recently, I would say 20 years, from 20 years ago to now, the, the, the respect and the recognition that slums structures are possible to be good and, and actually are good in many cases, especially those, I, I have to talk in cases like Caracas, Rio de Janeiro or Medellin, for example, where the topography helps, sometimes helps, sometimes problematic because of the danger. This is a, the, the risky, the borderline where we are dealing with. But at least we're talking about slums that have air and views and, trans and some, some relation with the city that other cities don't have, like Mexico City, for example, where the flat areas of the valley of the big esplanade of Mexico is expands infinitely in terms of slums that are equal and don't give the authenticity of a human urban space that can be re recognized. One thing that is very nice when you know slums and go to places like uh, informal settlements, that even though there are not places for ga big gatherings, but the sense of public space, the intimacy of public space, reminds me. For example, the mosque where you can have three people, three people uh, praying in a mosque. Well, three people meeting in a small space in a slum is a very important place. The thing, the, the main problem is, is services, of course and the need of more open space and the relationship with the possibilities of nature and the close approach to transportation to allow people to move easier. These, those are the main problems, but that, that has to be solved. In terms of the housing, the people can build their own houses and that has been demonstrated. Julian? Uh, thank you Maybe very much. Last uh, one or two questions. Th th thanks for the you know, presentations and, and I wanted to uh, echo some of the the, uh, the points that came <coughs> forward, uh, I was struck by, you know, the bringing back memories of Nelson Goodman, you know, work, you know, especially <coughs> the work that, you know, the, the book Ways of World Making, you know, and we, he talks about this sort of notion that that part of, of, of our work has to do with kind of reconnection and recomposition of things that have already been done somehow. So there is a sense of the, the you know, question of the authenticity is where is the origin of the authentic in a certain way. And I think you know what we saw before from, from Renato's presentation in terms of this searching for the traces of you know those moments in which the first stone was laid on the ground to you know Java or to the kind of a transforming you know the kind of a void in the city into something that is different. I think is very significant. You know significant ways in which, you know, memory, you know, going back, and, and this is where the question that I'd like to formulate goes, is you know, this notion of the, the bodily experience and how that can become sort of, you know, sensuality, you know, uh, you know, the kind of physicalness, the haptic, you know, conditions are part of what what we do. And I want to rephrase the question because I, I'd like for you, if you could 
if you can expand a little bit more on this idea of the presentia that you mentioned. But I'd like to frame that in in one word that 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 uh, that Walter Benjamin suggested long time ago, which says that architecture's mystery and power relies on the fact that, as he would say, represents a form of art, the reception of the reception of which is done in state of distractness. The power of architecture relies in, in the fact that it's a form of art, the reception of which is done in state of distractness. And that, in a certain way, calls much attention to this notion that the building needs to be seen. Because in a certain way, it's not the case. At least what Benjamin is suggesting is, is actually the power of space relies on the fact that it's not about visuality, you know, which you try, you know, clearly to demonstrate in, in, in the kind of a, uh, uh, the, the animations, let's say, of the lighting, you know, in the kind of Cordoba. But maybe if you can expand a little bit more on this idea of the presence, you know, on the body, because I think it's very powerful. Well, uh, I think, um, I think you, you've stated it quite well. Um, I s myself struggle with the connection between presentia, which in the literature of pilgrimage and religious uh, pilgrimage, it's, it's highly mystified and it's highly mystical and it does seem to have something to do with breathing the same air uh, that the Shroud of Turin or the, you know, the, um, well, that's sealed now, but, uh, but you know, whatever relic that it's there and I'm here and there's something mystical about, mystically charged about this. And I almost don't want to make that connection because it's, it, just as I don't like, uh, there's also a connection to be made with phenomenology in all of this, but I don't think, especially with my students, it's good to introduce that kind of writing and thinking because it is too dependent on these mystical uh, ontologically, you accept them because they are. Uh, and I think that uh, disempowers uh, us to really reach a deeper understanding. I'm much more interested in the resonance between emerging neuroscience about how we experience things uh, as not a disembodied mind, but as an embodied mind-body system, and you can't get away from that. It, it mediates every experience we have. And I think Renata's uh, description of the kinesthetic experience, we don't see things in a frontal frame view, we experience things by moving through them. And that's a lot of the effort of how to use video, how to use computer uh, animation and, and other tools to capture that relationship and take the measure in the best tradition of architectural drawing. How do you take the measure of that exper embodied experience of, uh, of space? Um, because we have new tools and new understandings that allow us to do that, and I'm trying to mobilize an army of students to help explore that territory. And I think uh, uh, the best um, tools for that are more specific language that comes back to architecture. How do you translate what we experience into drawing, which is what we've always done for hundreds of years, since we have new tools of translation, we need new ways of thinking that will help us with that act of translation too. Renan? Well, I have essentially a question and a comment. Um, the, I think it's the comment first. Would you? So in this little experiment that I did, um, the problem is that the more tools you have, uh, you have to be careful that you're not sort of using a, um, a hammer on a fly, so to speak, because you just, it, every tool creates its own problems. And so the, um, uh, and yet, uh, when you're actually dealing with um, uh, the question of making models for students of the best architecture, how do you present it? The minute that you do this, you only have so many tools to present this particular space or building, uh, utilizing these tools or these tools. And, the, uh, and of course, we live now. So uh, any present representation of a historic monument 
is already a reconstruction, and this is where you know you you you're you're constantly in um, in this um, you know uh, no win solution, or else you can just say okay, let's just be metaphoric about the whole thing, but but uh, but uh, putting pressure on uh, this question of well, all right, so you experience it bodily, so that means that for me to teach the Moss of Cordoba and its history, we all have to go there. But no, because in fact, if we go there and it's completely lit up by fluorescence, it's might as well just stay at Penn. You know, and so, so on it goes. Uh, uh, and so I think that uh, these are key issues to to constantly um, be alert to and uh, utilize whatever experiment. Simply, uh, it, this was just an experiment. But every single student that was in this experiment is now fully alive to these problems of, you know, the nature of lighting, the nature of, um, and yet I still don't know whether my first comment on whether al Hakam invented the polylobe screen or not, you know, and it was a memory, a, a memory trick to be sure subsequently when it was repeated, nobody repeated that. And so I don't know, but it's my idea. Well, there you go. Yeah. So. Uh, the, the haptic aspect, I think, is, is one that we need to look at more. I would say that yes. thank you for your comments, and let's uh, go for lunch. Maya, uh, and then we will come back in a minute. Since but I Maya's have the audience, I just wanted to, because I can't stay this afternoon, I'm going to come and have lunch with you, but I have to go to my other life. But um, because of the memory that we've been talking about, I want to send you home with Mementos, does that work? Um, memory. Roger Williams University is celebrating, along with the governor's office and other organizations around the state, the 350th anniversary of the Rhode Island Colonial Charter. And to commemorate that, one of the things we've done is prepare a set of boxed cards. And I would just like you to take a set of them home with you when you leave. They'll be in the lunch in the gallery. And we also have our recent edition of the Roger Williams University magazine, which is really quite good. And I'd love for you all to take one home with you, or two, and read it, and share it, and just stay in touch. It was really wonderful meeting all of you. And I hope we do this every single year for as long as we're around. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.